Hello students. So today we are going to see the lesson reproduction in plants and animals. So in this lesson we will see what is reproduction and how reproduction takes place in uh, plants, the types of reproduction and also the reproductive organs of animals and some of the hygiene measures regarding the reproductive uh, system. So in this lesson you will see all these things in detail. So let us go into the lesson. So you know what is reproduction. You would have been uh, studied in your earlier classes about what is reproduction and how uh, plants will reproduce. Uh, in a brief way. So uh, in this lesson you will learn a, a little bit uh, detail. So let me start the lesson. First we will see what is reproduction first. So reproduction means it is the ability to produce its kind. So a living organism, all living organisms have the ability to reproduce its kind. A dog can uh, have the ability to produce another dog. A human can produce another human. So all the organisms have the ability to produce of its own kind. Uh, likewise in plants also it will be said. Say. Uh, if you take an apple tree from the seed, you can produce a new apple tree. So, uh, it can produce its kind. That is what is said here. The ability to produce its kind. So, uh, reproduction means it is the continuity of species. Continuity means uh, for a species to live, for a species to live in existence, what we need reproduction. So, a group of uh, dogs are there, a group of humans are there. What happens if they don't reproduce for a longer period? All the dogs that are living, they live and they die. You know, no new organisms will be produced. For new organisms to produce, uh, we need uh, reproduction. So, that is what I said. Continuity of species. For a species to live in existence without extinction, so we need reproduction. Next is reproduction time increase. So the reproduction time of the, all the organisms varies from organism to organism. For dog we may have 65 days. For humans it takes 28 days. So likewise in each organism the reproduction time varies uh, from organism to organism. The time varies. So the reproduction time of each organism varies. So now we will see what is sexual reproduction. So in sexual reproduction what happens? The male and female gametes fuse together to form sexual reproduction. So in this gametes we have the genetic material. So then next in this genetic material what happens with that? We get the character traits. The characters from our parents. In sexual reproduction, what happens? The male and female gametes fuse. In these gametes, the genetic material are present. So, in this genetic material, it helps to uh, show the characteristics of our parents. So, uh, with the help of the genetic material only, the characters pass from one generation to another generation. So, this is the sexual reproduction, the meaning of sexual reproduction. Now we are going to see the reproduction in plants. Reproduction in plants. First we are going to see about the plants alone. So first type is uh, vegetative reproduction. The second type is asexual reproduction. And the third is sexual reproduction. So in plants there are three types of reproduction. First is vegetative reproduction. The second is asexual reproduction and third is sexual reproduction. So vegetative reproduction means from the vegetative parts like the root, the stem, the leaves, a new plant will be produced. In asexual reproduction means with the help of spores, no gametes will be there, only a single parent will be responsible for the reproduction. But uh, spores will be present for reproduction. So that is only asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction means as you know, fusion of male and female gametes to form a new organism or zygote. So that is only sexual reproduction. So we will see how it happens in detail. First we will take the vegetative reproduction. The 
vegetative reproduction. In, in this, new plantlets are formed from somatic cells. So, no sex cells or gametes will be involved in this reproduction. What happens? Somatic cells. So, somatic cells means the body cells. The body cells will be responsible for the reproduction. From this body cells, the somatic cells, new plants will be produced. So, vegetative part grows in more new plants. So, I, likewise I said, the stem, root and leaf, all these parts are only called the vegetative parts. From this vegetative part, a new plant will be produced. So, that is what is happening in vegetative reproduction. So, from the vegetative part, a new organism, a new plant will be produced. Vegetative part is nothing but the stem, root and the leaf. The stem, root and the leaf. In this vegetative reproduction, mitotic division takes place. Mitotic division means, you know, uh, mitosis, what happens? The cell will be present, the uh, nucleus will elongate and form into two daughter nucleus. So, that is what is called mitotic division. So, in this uh, vegetative reproduction, how the cells divide? Through mitotic division, the mitosis takes place. And similar to parents. So, after a plant is there, uh, it will, uh, the leaf or the uh, root will uh, separate from the plant and they fall on the ground and they grow into a new plant. So, they will look like a parent, they will be straight, similar like the parent. So, that is what similar to the parents and mitotic division takes place. So, these are the points under vegetative reproduction. New plantlets will be formed form from the somatic cells, the body cells. Vegetative part grows into a new plant. Vegetative parts are nothing but the stem, root and leaves. Mitotic division takes place and similar to the parents. Next is vegetative. How uh, you will take each part? We said vegetative parts means the leaf, root and the cells. So, we, uh, we will take each part as the e one one example for all these things. First, we are going to take the leaves. So, bryophyllum. All the bryophyllum plants, like you can see in the diagram, the, in the leaf notches, the leaf end corner, the plants will grow and they fall off to form a new plant. So, in bryophyllum plants, they are, the plants, small plantlets will grow in the edges of the leaves and they fall uh, on suitable uh, uh, conditions, they grow into a new plant. So this is one of the vegetative part, how it grows. In bryophyllum, small plants at the leaf notches will grow into a new bryophyllum plant. Now I am going to give a recap from the first. First, I told you what is the re reproduction, the ability to reproduce. When an organism has the ability to reproduce, to produce its own kind, then it is called as a reproduction. It helps in the continuity of species, for a species to live with existence. This reproduction helps and the kind varies from organism to organism. So, uh, each organism has a different time, reproduction time. Then we saw what is reproduction, the sexual reproduction. It involves fusion of male and female gametes. In this gametes, the genetic material is present. The genetic material helps in passing the characteristics or the character traits from parents. So this is the introduction part and then we saw the three types of reproduction in plants. Reproduction in plants, this are three types. Vegetative reproduction, asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. First we are going to see this one first one the vegetative reproduction alone. Then in this we saw the new plants from the vegetative part that is the leaf, the root, the stem or new plant is produced. So that, that is called as vegetative reproduction. Here mitotic division, the mitosis only takes place that is the nucleus divides to form two daughter nuclei and we will see uh, the reproduction in, uh, based on each part. First we saw in leaves, uh, in bryophyllum, at the leaf notches, the end of the leaf, small small plantlets will grow and uh, after a few, a few days or a few time period what happens? It grows into a new bryophyllum plant. So this is what.
for the second. Now the next part is the stem. Here what happens? The weak aerial stem touch the ground and give off roots and buds. So uh, you can see the picture in your book. What happens? The plant will be there. Uh, usually it happens in weak stems, not the strong ones, not the strong woody ones. The weak and tender stems. What happens? It just bends like uh, uh, bends to the ground and the root is formed and it grows into a new plant. So uh, in stem, this type of method will happen. Uh, what happens? The weak aerial stem it just bends to the ground and it will uh, the it will catch the ground with the help of root has and it will start. Then it will break off and grow into a new plant. You can see it in your book itself. So example is strawberry or these plants. This type of reproduction only takes place through these stems. It is a vegetative reproduction. So this type of uh, root formation is called as adventitious. Adventitious is nothing but uh, instead of coming from the root uh, root nodules, what happens if, if the root has comes from the other parts? It is called as adventitious. What happens from the stem? Uh, the, from the stem, the root has is formed. So it is not a part to form root. Work. It is a uh, it is a special uh, place to form the root has. So that is why it is called as adventitious roots. So weak aerial stems when they touch the ground and give off roots and they form into a root plant. So this method is done in stems. Next what happens? Uh, like I said, the connection is broken from the parent and they become an independent plant. Next is the roots. Uh, tuberous roots. Tubers are mostly uh, the round ones are called as tubers. Nothing but the potato. All the potatoes are called as tubers. So the asparagus, the sweet potato, all these are tubers. From the tubers a new plant will be formed. Uh, if you have seen a potato, you know what happens. The potato will be in the ground and from the potato the plant will be formed. So the, the root from the root it is a modified root. The tuber is a modified root. So uh, tuberous roots from the tuberous roots a new plant will be formed. For example, asparagus and sweet potato. And next is the bulbils. The bulbils what happens? The flower bud. So buds will be present. After that only it will bloom to a new flower. So in the flower bud stage itself what happens? It will change into a round globose bulb like structure and it forms and grows into a new plant. So this way of uh, matter is done in bulbils. The flower bud will be formed into a globose bulb and it will form into the ground to form a new plant. Example again. In a gay plant this type of reproduction is done. Next is fragmentation. So fragmentation means uh, example spirogyra. What happens? The spirogyra it is a ribbon like structure but it will have compartments uh, small small boxes like structure. If you know the spirogyra diagram means you know it will be like compartments. What happens? The each compartment if it breaks off it has the ability to grow into a new organism, new plant. So that is called as fragmentation. When the breaking of elements, so uh, take example, this is a spirogyra, it is a ripple like structure. It has, so uh, this is a filament. What happens if this breaks off and they have the ability to move, form into a new plant? So, break when this filament breaks into fragments, that is, parts, and each fragment has a cell. So, inside uh, each fragment, the cell is present in the center and form a new filament by cell. So this uh, fragment what happens? It breaks off. This filament part will break into a fragment. That fragment will have cell. What happens? A cell division takes place and it will be uh, elongated and it forms into a new plant. So that is what is happening in fragmentation. Next is fission method. So in this uh, fission method what happens? The cell will elongate and divide into two. So 
the parent cell divides into two daughter cells or the parent cell will be present they will uh, form into the cell the nucleus will elongate and the cell wall will close and they will separate and it forms into a other example amoeba in amoeba not binary fission will be happening binary means it forms binary means two by two so uh, two cells will be formed from binary fission so uh, fission method is done in amoeba next is regeneration regeneration what happens lost body part to whole organism so example hydra what happens in hydra and all if a if a part of, of a plant is fallen what happens that uh, that uh, broken part will form into a the, it will reform it. Uh, for example if you take lizard what happens when its uh, tail is cut what happens after some days a new tail will be formed that is called regeneration the the lost part or the broken part will again uh, be produced so they they don't they don't have it so that is what is said here a uh, lost body part if, if uh, with any accident or something happens if it is broken it will uh, form again to a fall organism the fallen part also will be formed into a new organism example hydra hydra and planaria so uh, i have uh, drawn a diagram here the hydra is present and here the bud is formed and it develops into a new hydra a uh, notch is formed and the bud is formed and it forms into a new plant and here you can see the tentacles so this is what is happening in regeneration now i will give you a small recap from the first first we saw about the vegetative leaf production and in bryophyllum leaves in the leaf pouches small plantlets will be formed and next is the stem here the weak radial stem it will bend to the ground and form into a new plant uh, the root has to help to uh, hold the ground that is the solid to form a new plant uh, in strawberry example so next what happens it breaks off and forms into a new plant and the uh, roots means tuberous roots or the potatoes the asparagus sweet potatoes they will form a plant and next is bulbs in bulbs what happens the flower bud will be converted into globose bulb and it will fall like a seed it will fall into the ground and form into a new plant fragmentation means the filaments will break into fragments and each filament will have cell inside it and they will have the ability to form into a new organism by cell division example spirogyra and next is fission from the parent cell it will divide into two daughter nuclei uh, example amoeba then that nucleus will uh, develop to form an adult next is regeneration in regeneration when a body uh, is lost body part is lost what happens it forms into a new plant and the lost part also will be formed again example hydra and planaria so what happens hydra is here a bud is formed and later on it forms into a new hydra and hydra this is the second type of reproduction the asexual reproduction first we saw about what is the vegetative reproduction and each of the parts the leaf the roots the tubers bulbs special fragmentation and everything is on now next is the asexual reproduction in asexual reproduction what happens only a single parent is involved only a single parent is involved that is either may be male or female without fusion of gametes so since only one gamete that is only one parent is present no fusion takes place only a single parent is present mitotic cell division takes place so in asexual reproduction also mitosis takes place mitotic cell division takes place exact copies of parents so exact copies of parents uh, they will be they will be similar to their parents when they form into a new adult so uh, next we will see how these sexual asexual will 
production takes place. So this is the hyphae, rhizoidal hyphae. This is a formula in this rhizoidal hyphae is present. So rhizoidal hyphae. Hyphae means it is usually present in fungi when the, uh, they are branched. When they are branched, when a fungi is branched, then they are called as hyphae. So since it, it forms rhizoids, here you can see the root has since it forms the rhizoids, it, it is called as rhizoidal hyphae. So hyphae means I told you it is branched. So here we have a structure like this that is the sporangium. Sporangium. So in this sporangium we have the spores. So I have taken a detailed diagram of this alone. So this sporangium, what happens inside this, these spores will be present. So this is the spore, the age spore. This is a detailed diagram of spore. And the young mycelium will see what happens over there. Reproduction by spore formation. In asexual reproduction, what happens? The spore formation, the small spore formation, the reproduction takes place. So, common method in fungi and bacteria. In asexual reproduction, this will be usually happening in fungi. I told you hyphae. So, in bacteria also, asexual reproduction takes place. Sporangium develops from fungal hyphae. Like we saw in the diagram, what happens? From the hyphae, the fungal hyphae, a sporangium is formed. From the branched hyphae, the sporangium is formed. Nucleus divides to form spore within the sporangium. So what happens? Inside the sporangium, many spores are present. Small, small dots you can see. So those are the spores. You can find these spores. They will have nucleus. So inside this sporangium, the cell division takes place. The spores will divide. So what, what type of division? Mitosis. Mitotic division takes place inside the sporangium. Nucleus divides to form spores within the sporangium. Next what happens? Each nucleus has small amount of cytoplasm. So I said inside this sporangium, the nucleus will be present and they divide to form the spores. So these nucleus will have small amount of cytoplasm in each of the nucleus. Then after reaching the ground, the spores develop into a new hyphae. So what happens? Inside this sporangium, many spores are present. They will divide. The mitosis will happen inside this sporangium, and each nucleus will divide to form spores. And this spore, what happens? It spreads to the ground, and they form into a new ground, new hyphae, like right? this. So this is the A section. So here, no fusion is happening. No body, no fragmentation of fusion is happening. This spore itself will form into another new hyphae, new plant, new fungi. So only a single parent is present. So after reaching the ground, the spores develop into a new hyphae. So this is the method of asexual reproduction. Next, we are moving on to the third part of reproduction, the sexual reproduction. Here, two gametes fuse to form an offspring. Like I said before, fusion of the male and female gametes are formed into a new offspring or new organism. So, the male and female produce gametes from the reproductive organs. So, what happens? A male individual is present, a female individual is present, they have reproductive organs and those reproductive organs will produce uh, gametes, the male will produce male gametes and female will produce female gametes and they fuse to form an offspring. So this is what is happening in sexual reproduction. Now I am going to give a detailed recap from the First, what happens? Asexual reproduction happens. Uh, this is the second part of the reproduction.
introduction here a single parent is only present in asexual reproduction no fusion of gametes is happening mitotic cell division takes place exact copies of parents will be they are in new offspring will be exact copies of the parents so asexual reproduction usually happens in uh, bacteria and fungi reproduction by spore formation so asexual reproduction happens with the production of spores it is a common method in fungi and bacteria this sporangium develops from fungal hyphae so from this rhizoidal fungal hyphae a sporangium is formed nucleus divides to form spore within the sporangium so inside the sporangium small small pores you can find so those nucleus divides to form spores and each nucleus each nucleus has small amount of cytoplasm so in this each nucleus is a sporangium the spores are present they have nucleus and cytoplasm they will undergo mitotic division and they only will this each spore will fall to the ground and form into a new hyphae and next is the sexual reproduction the two gametes are fused to form a offspring the male and female gametes fuse to form a offspring so uh, gametes male uh, 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 gets a reproductive organ to produce two gametes and female reproductive organ to give female uh, gamete and they fuse to form sexual reproduction now we are going to see the parts of a typical flower so we saw the three types of reproduction that is vegetative reproduction production asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction under sexual reproduction uh, how, how how it happens inside a flower so how reproduction happens inside a flower cell so for that we, we should know what are the parts involved in sexual reproduction so for that we are going to see the parts of a typical flower what are the different parts present in the flower so first i have drawn a yellow thing you can see this is the gynoecium so this is the ovary then style stigma so ovary style stigma these are the gynoecium that is the female part the ovary style and stigma and next you can see the white and the pink part that is the pollen grains so you would have seen in uh, high viscous flower no? the yellowish powdery substance so those are called the pollen grains so Uh, this one is the antrichium that is the main reproductive part of a flower so in antrichium you have a filament this white thing is called white thread like structure is called the filament and the pink uh, structure is called the anther filament and anther uh, comes under antrichium whereas ovary style stigma comes under gynoecium that is the female part and below you can see in flowers and all you will find in rows uh, and in high viscous you can find the uh, uh, yellow green color part you will have the flower and underneath you will have green color uh, sepal like structure that is the calyx so calyx and the petal is known as petal or corolla calyx the three part is the calyx and the petal is the corolla calyx and corolla so these are the parts of a typical flower so you should know all the parts then only you will understand the uh, process of reproduction what happens inside it so these are the parts next we will see uh, in theoretical first is the calyx so calyx will have sepals like i said the number of sepals the petal like structures underneath those are called sepals so calyx has uh, two two sepals three sepals according to the flower the number of sepals differ and corolla means as i told petals so corolla is called as petals calyx corolla and antrichium so antrichium is nothing but the 
anther and the filament. The filament and the anther. So this white thing, the pollen grain part where the pollen grain is present, that is the antherium. So it will have stamens. And dinesium, the ovary side stigma. So this part is the gynesium part. So it will have carpels. These three parts together called as carpels. Whereas in antherium it is called as stamens. For corolla it is petal. For calyx it is sepals. So these are the four worlds of the flower. So totally flower will have four worlds. What are those? Calyx, corolla, antherium and dinesium. So you will see what are the essential worlds. So essential worlds are antherium and dinesium. So antherium, the male part and the female reproductive part are known as the essential worlds. Why means? Because they directly take part in the process of reproduction. As we know, fusion of male and female gametes is called as sexual reproduction. So here, the male is the antherium and female is the gynecium. So these both are directly involved. So that is why it is called as essential worlds. Non-essential worlds are calyx and corolla. Why means? Because they do not take part in the reproduction. So they are simply present for the outer appearance alone. The petal and the sepal, the calyx are present for outer appearance. So it is a non-essential worlds. Non-essential worlds, calyx and corolla. So these are the parts of the flower and they are uh, uh, stamens and petals, they are, uh, how they are called as. So these are these things. I will give you a short recap from the first. So this is the uh, diagram of a typical flower. Here you have ovary, style, stigma, filament is present, anther is present. So these three are called as dynesium together and uh, filament and anther is called as the antherium. The petals are present and below here you can find the calyx. So a flower has four, four words. Calyx means sepals. So calyx will contain sepals. Corolla means petals. Antherium contains stamens. And dynesium contains carpels. So these are the four words of a flower. And essential words are antherium and dynesium. Why? Because they are directly involved in the process of reproduction and non-essential worlds means calyx and corolla. They do not take part in the process of reproduction. They are simply present for the outer appearance alone. Now we are going to see about the essential worlds of a flower in detail. Essential worlds means what? Antherium and Dynation, those which take part directly in the process of reproduction, they are known as essential worlds. So now we are going to see about the antherium, gynesium and pollen grains. So first we move on to antherium. The main part composed of stamens. So the antherium is the main part and it consists of stamens. As we saw before, antherium means it consists of Stamens and it is the main part. And next, each stamen has a filament and anther. Like I showed you the flower diagram, the typical flower diagram, uh, a filament and anther will be present. So this is the diagram is the antherium, the filament and the anther. Each stamen has a filament and anther. So this one structure is considered as a one stamen. And pollen grains are produced in the anther. So inside this anther, this yellow structure, you will have the pollen grains. Pollen grains are nothing but the yellow powdery substance that you see in some flowers. So those are called pollen grains and they are present in the anther with the pollen sac. So inside this anther, small small pollen sacs will be present. So inside that only the pollen grains are present. So these are the points under antherium. The main part is composed of stamens. Each stamen has a filament and anther. Then the pollen grain is produced in the pollens. 
sap. And next we are going to see about the pollen grains. When a pollen grain is taken and a, a cross section is made, we can see the internal structure. What are the things that are present inside the pollen grain? We can see. So uh, by taking the cross section, we found out that it is spherical in shape. That is, it is round in shape and it has two layers. So it is covered up with two layers and it is spherical in shape. So the, we, we read here, it consists of two layers. It is two layers. What are those two layers? Means exon and intine. Exon and intine. So these are the two layers of pollen grains. So how this exon will be? It is a hard outer layer. So the outer layer is very hard. So that is what is called as exon. So it will have a germ pore. Germ pore is nothing but it has pores. Small small pores on the outer, hard outer layer. So those pores are known as, those holes are known as germ pore. So what is our next sign? Hard outer layer and it has a pores or holes. So those are called as germ pore. Next is the intine. It is a thin continuous layer. Thin continuous layer. So uh, imagine it is a spherical in shape and the outer layer is very rough and inside the intine layer is very thin and it is continuous. So it is thin and continuous layer and it consists of cellulose and actin. So that layer, that intent layer is made up of cellulose and pectin. So these are the points under intent. Now, this inside this pollen grain, two types of cells are present. One is the vegetative cell and the other is the generative cell. Vegetative cell and generative cell. So this vegetative cell has large nucleus. It has large nucleus whereas in generative cell it has two male gametes. Two male gametes. So from this we can find that this is the body cell. So it is vegetative. It is the body cell. This is the sex cell. That is the reproductive cell. So like we have body cells. We have somatic cells and sex cells like that. The vegetative cell is for uh, the uh, outer uh, parts, the body cells and this is for reproduction. So this vegetative cell has large nucleus and generative cells have two main gametes inside it. So these are the points and the pollen grains. Now we saw what is antrician and pollen grain is also an important part in uh, antrician. So we saw the detailed structure of pollen grains. Exine and intine and what are the types of cells present inside this pollen grain. Next we are moving on to the female part that is the gynecium. The gynecium it is the female part. Antrician is the main part and gynecium is the female part. And this it is made up of three parts. The ovary, style and stigma. So like I showed you in the flower diagram we have a ovary, style and stigma. So ovary, style and stigma. These three parts are called as together gynecium. The style, stigma and ovary. Next, this ovary contains ovules. It has ovules. So this ovary, inside this ovary, you would have ovules. So when uh, from the pollen grain, uh, the gametes go inside the uh, gynecia and their reproduction takes place. So uh, main part will move or the main gamete will move from uh, antrician, it will move on to the gynecium and here reproduction takes place and the seed will be formed. So this is the process of sexual reproduction and we saw the parts of gynecium. So I will give you a short recap from the first. We saw what is antrician, this is the main part, it has stamens and each stamen has a element and anther. Pollen grains are present in the anther that is inside the pollen sac. And next we saw the pollen grains, it is spherical and two layered. What are those two layers? Exine and entine.
right? Exine is a very hard outer layer. It has small small pores called germ pore, and in time it, it is a thin continuous layer. It is made up of cellulose and pectin. Pollen grains are divided into two types of cells. It contains two types of cells. One is the vegetative cell, and the other is the generative cell. Vegetative cell has large nucleus in it. And generative cell has two male gametes. Why male gametes? Because it is ambition. The male part. So male gametes. Two male gametes are present. And gynecia. It is the female part. It has three parts: the ovary, side, and stigma. And inside this ovary, small small ovules will be present. So inside gynecia only, the production takes place when the pollen grains move. Uh, from the antrusia, it goes inside the gynecia and reproduction takes place. Now, we are going to see about the structure of ovule. Why we are seeing the structure of ovule? Because it is present inside the gynecia. So, what is the last point we saw in gynecia? The ovary has many ovules inside it. So, this is the structure of one ovule, the detailed structure of one ovule. So, like for anation, we saw the structure of pollen grains. Likewise, for gynecia, we are going to see about the structure of ovule. So, the center egg like structure, white layer is the embryo sac. And after that, two layers of integuments are present. And after the embryo sac, the new cell is present, and the outer layer is the chalaza. And below you can find a stalk-like structure called funiculus, and the basal opening. Uh, this this uh, new cell is present, so the basal opening is the micropyle. So chalaza, new cell, embryo sac, integuments, and micropyle and so these are the parts of a ovule. So I am going to tell the uh, each of the function what they do. So then you can remember the names also. So first we are taking the nucellus. That is after the embryo sac, the nucellus is present. So this nucellus it is enclosed with two integuments. Like you can see. The mucilage is present. After that, two layers are present. So, uh, the mucilage is covered with two layers of integuments and opening called mycophile. So, below uh, the basal part, you can find an opening called mycophile. And next, ovary attached to the ovule by a stalk called funiculus. So, the ovary is there, uh, with the ovary, how the, the ovary is present, how these ovules are attached with this stalk only. So, example, uh, you can take a thermocall ball and if you stick these sticks, what will happen? If you play these sticks, it will stand up. So, likewise, the ovary is present and small, small ovules are being uh, plugged. So, with this stalk, so that is the Funiculus. Uh, next, the chalaza. It is present in the, in the basal part. So this is this chalaza. It is only the basal part. And next, embryo sac has seven cells. So this embryo sac, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six. Six cells are present. But what they told here? Seven cells are present. The eight cell will be present with the mucellus. So six cells and seven cells are present. Seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight cells are present. What it tell is the eight cell will be present inside the mucellus. So it will be present inside the mucellus. Totally eight cells are present in the embryo sac and one cell will be present within the mucellus and three cells will be present in the micropylar end. Three cells will be present in the micropylar end. As you can see here, three cells are present. Uh, since micropyle is present, it is called as the 
micropylar end. So three cells are present. These three cells are called as egg apparatus. Egg apparatus. And next three cells, they are present in the chalaza end. Where the chalaza end, the basal part, the three cells are present. One, two, three cells are present. So it is present in the chalaza end. These three cells are called as antipodal cells. What are they called as? Antipodal cells. So these antipodal cells, what they do is, they give nourishment to the egg that is getting fertilized. So what happens inside this ovule? The uh, pollen grain comes inside and reproductive takes place, fertilization and it will uh, form into an egg, a fertilized egg. Zygote. So all those things you know. So what this uh, uh, antipodal cell does is it gives nourishment, nutrition to this egg. So these three antipodal cells are present in the chalaza egg. And next two cells are in the center. So it is called as polar nuclei. So in the center two small dots are present. So those two cells are called as polar nuclei. Polar nuclei. So these are the cells present inside the embryo sac. So this polar nuclei, what happens? When pollen grain comes, they will fuse together. So this is the female gamete. Why? Because it is present in the gynecium. So when pollen grains come, these cells will get fused together. So two cells are present in the center. It is known as the polar nuclear. Next we are going to see, we saw we have three cells which is present in the micropylar end. It is called as egg apparatus. So above this egg apparatus we are going to see what are the each of the cells. So one cell is the egg cell which is the female gamete. So here in the micropylar end, in the micropylar end, you can find one cell which is bigger, that is the female gamete, that is the egg cell, the sex cell of the ovary. So the, this cell is the female gamete and two cells are the synergids. So the bigger one is the female gamete and the other two are synergids. These two are synergids and the bigger one is the female gamete. What the synergids does is, they will direct the pollen grains to come inside. So, uh, uh, through this end only the pollen grains will come. So, it will direct how to uh, get fused. So, the synergids are present and the female gamete is present. Next, we are going to see the process of sexual reproduction in flowering animals. The process of sexual reproduction in flowering animals. So, uh, we uh, here on the earth we saw the parts, different parts. First, we saw the parts of the flower and what are the parts involved. Then we saw the various parts, the addition, the variation. All those parts are not we saw. Now, we are going to see about the process. How they are getting fused. So those uh, in that the first process is called the first pollination. So first is the pollination and the second is the fertilization. So these are the two processes involved in sexual reproduction of plants. The pollination and fertilization. So what is pollination? When transfer of pollen grains from anther to the stigma. So, we know uh, on the anther only the pollen grains are present that is in the antheration. So, what happens is this pollen grain flies off or to any other way of uh, transportation. So, what happens from this anther, the antheration, the pollen grains come and reach the gynecium where in the stigma. So we saw ovary, sty and stigma. So the top part, how from the, the pollen grain from antheration, how they move to the stigma. That is what is said here. 
from the anchor to the uh, stigma. How they transfer of pollen grains from the anchor to the stigma. So that process is called as pollination. So these are the points under pollination. Now next we will see about pollination in detail. Now I will give you a recap from the first. First we saw the structure of ovule. These ovules are present in the gynecia that is inside the ovary. And we have the uh, basal part the chalaza, new cellless, embryo cell is present in the center. It is covered by two integuments and micropyle is present and a stalk called cuniculus is present. So new cellless it is enclosed with two integuments and an opening called micropyle is present and the ovary is attached to the ovule by a stalk called funiculus. So the ovary is attached to the ovule with a stalk called funiculus and the chalaza, the basal part is present and inside the embryo sac, seven cells are present and the egg is present inside the mucellus. So seven cells will be present inside this uh, embryo sac and one will be inside the mucellus. And three cells will be present in the micropyle end. This is the egg apparatus and this is the antipodal cells. They will give nourishment to the egg. And in the center, the polar nuclei. These two cells are called as the polar nuclei. So, uh, for the egg apparatus, one cell is the female gametes and two cells are synergics. So, one cell is the female gamete and these two cells are synergics. Synergics will direct the pollen grains to fuse. So, next we are moving on to the process of sexual reproduction in flowering plants. So, what are the two processes? Pollination and fertilization. So, pollination means when there is a transfer of pollen grains from anther, from the andrisha to the stigma of the gynesia. It is called as pollination. Next, we are going to see about the importance of pollination. So, we saw all the parts of the andrisha and gynesium that is used for uh, reproduction and last we saw the two processes of uh, sexual reproduction in flowering plants. First is the pollination. So what we saw transfer of pollen grains from anther to the stigma. So that is called as pollination. So now we are going to see the importance of pollination. So results in fertilization. So what happens? After pollination, fertilization takes place. So after fertilization, it leads to the formation of fruit and seeds. So when the pollen grain comes inside the gynesia and fertilization takes place, after that zygote is formed, then we can get fruit and seeds. So like this only, we get all the fruits and the seeds from the plants through sexual reproduction only. So next is new varieties of plants from cross pollination. So from cross pollination we get new varieties of plants. So cross pollination is nothing but when pollen grains from one plant it, it moves to the other plant of the same species that is called as cross pollination. From one plant the pollen grain flies to the other plant and they fuse to form the fruit or flower or seed. So uh, if, we, if one species of one kind of plant moves, moves, gives, a, gives its pollen grains and what happens? A fusion takes place. So uh, with this new varieties are formed. So that is what is said here. Through cross pollination we get new varieties of plants. So these are the importance of pollination. Next is type of pollination. So what, how, what are the ways pollination takes place? Uh, what are those types? Self pollination and cross pollination. So these two are the two types of 
pollination. So first is self pollination. So self pollination means autogamy because it does not depend on other elements or other materials for pollination. It itself can uh, do independently without any help. The pollination takes place. It does not need any help or any other agents for pollination. So that is why it is called as autogamy. It can independently pollinate within themselves. So self-pollination means when there is a transfer of pollen grains from anther to the sigma in the same or another flower born on the same plant. So what happens you take a single plant. In a single plant we have many flowers here and there. So what happens? Uh, the pollen grain from one flower may fly to the next flower that is nearby and they may fertilize. Or it can transfer its pollen grain within itself to the gynecia and there they can pollinate. It, it will happen according to the environmental conditions uh, based on the wind or any other thing. Uh, the transfer takes place. So, uh, the pollination occurs within the single plant itself. Uh, the pollen grain may fly from one flower to the other or it itself may pollinate and they fertilize. So, that is called as self-pollination. The pollination takes place within the same plant. It is called as self-pollination. So, example, hibiscus. In hibiscus plant, so it is you see similarly that plant, what happens? Self-pollination really happens. The uh, transfer of pollen grains will happen within the plant itself. So, this is called as self-pollination. Next, we are moving on to the advantages of self-pollination. So, we are going to see about the advantages. First is possible in certain bisexual class. So it is possible in certain bisexual class. So what are bisexual class? When the male and the female part are present in the same flower, it is known as bisexual flower. So the antisium also will be present in the same flower. The gynesium also will be present in the same flower. So that we call it as uh, bisexual. In high risk as example, we saw high risk as in hibiscus plants also, the antigen and gynesium will be present together. So, uh, in bisexual class, this type of pollination are possible. Then, they do not depend on agents of pollination. Since the pollination is happening within the same plant, it does not need any help. It does not need any other agents for pollination. So, that is what is said here. Do not depend on agents of pollination. And next is no wastage of pollen grains. So, uh, no long distance is here. Only if it is nearby or within the same plant. So, since the distance is very less, what happens? The pollen grains, very less pollen grains are needed for pollination. So, these are the three advantages of self-pollination. Next is disadvantage. Seeds are less in number. So when self-pollination takes place, this seeds, the number of seeds are very less in number. Next is the endosperm is minor. So after the seed coat, if you take a seed, after the seed coat, the endosperm will be present. So that endosperm, it will be very small. So what happens? It will produce only plants. So the endosperm should be large and strong. Then only the plants also will be very strong. So what happens here when self-pollination takes place? The endosperm is very small. It is very minute. So what happens? It will produce only weak plants. Next is no new varieties of plants are produced because the pollination is happening within the same plant. It's again and again it goes on to the same plant itself. So what happens? No new varieties are being produced. So these are the three advantages, sorry, disadvantages of self-pollination. 
Next we are moving on to the second type that is the cross pollination. First we saw self pollination. The second is the cross pollination. So what happens in cross pollination? When there is a transfer of pollen from anther of a flower to the stigma of another flower of same species. So what happens? The same it will happen between the same species but different plants. One plant may be present inside a, a place and the other plant uh, may be present uh, after five, five yards or uh, two three kilometers. So at a certain distance the next plant will be present. Through some uh, wind or something like that to the insects what happens? The pollen range from one plant uh, of the anther goes to the stigma of another plant. It won't have any relationship between the two plants but the, it will fly to the other plant and it gets pollinated. So such type of pollination is called as cross pollination. A cross is made. It does not have any relationship. It does not have any uh, communication between the two plants. Uh, with the agents of pollination like wind, insect, what happens? The pollination takes place. So it is a cross. Uh, it's all called as cross pollination. So the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of flower to the stigma of another flower of the same species. It, it is not in same plant but it is in same species. That is called as cross pollination. So example, apple, grapes, plums. So in these fruits and all, fruit plants and all, this cross pollination is happening. So advantages of cross pollination. Next we are going to see the advantages of cross pollination. Seeds develop and germinate to form new varieties of plants. So what happens? Seeds will fertilize and they germinate and develop to form new varieties of plants. So you can think uh, the pollination occurs between the same species only. And how can we get new varieties of plants? So the quality, one, uh, one plant may be in no good quality. It may produce a very good quality of fruits. It is a very healthy plant. Whereas, whereas the Compared to this plant, the other plant will be a little less uh, in quality. The fruits will be very small, it won't be very sweet. So what happens when, when it gets crossed, some characters of this uh, healthy plant may we may get. What happens? So a new variety. Uh, this is some of the characters of this plant, the uh, not much healthier plant also we get. And some of the characters of healthy plant also we get. We may get a dark uh, color of the fruit. It may be very large. So what happens? A cross is made uh, between the two plants. So the, that is what is said here. So that is what we say. New varieties of plants. So seeds develop and they germinate to form new varieties of plants. Next, viable seeds are produced. Viable seeds means those which have the uh, ability to germinate. So if we sow the seed means it has to grow. Then only it is called as a viable seed. It can grow. When it has the ability to germinate and grow into a new plant, then it is called as a viable seed. So such type of seeds are produced in cross pollination, viable seeds. Next we are moving on to the disadvantages. So what are the disadvantages? Pollination may fail due to distance barrier. So sometimes the process of pollination may fail. Why? Because when there is a long distance between the one plant and the other plant, uh, when there is no uh, much stronger wind or when there is no insect, what happens? The pollination gets fail. That process will be fail. So that is what is said here. Pollination may fail due to distance barrier. When it, when it is at a greater distance, the pollination may fail. Next, more wastage of pollen grains. So, since the distance are very uh, uh, long, uh, since there is a very long distance, more pollen grains and some may fall off in the ground uh, like 30 
but some may grow only a very, very little may grow inside the plant. So that is why they tell more number of uh, pollen grains are getting wasted. Then may introduce some unwanted characters. So may introduce some unwanted characters means uh, for example I have already said you if uh, if a, for, for a healthy plant, when a plant, when a pollen grain from not much healthier plant, when it comes seeds, the uh, some of the characters of healthier plants will be formed. So as I said before, so what happens when when here, for example, this is another example, we have a very healthier plant here. We have a weed plant here. So it is it, so weeds are just it is a waste. Uh, so uh, when when the uh, weeds are present, what we do? We remove it. So it's great. When some of the uh, weed pollen grains comes and mixes, or when, uh, when some of the uh, infected plant pollen grains comes and mixes with the healthy, healthier uh, plant, what happens? When they fertilize, it will have the uh, unwanted character. So that is what is told here. When some of the unwanted characters may so anything can happen since uh, uh, long distance is there, it has to come from uh, a very long distance, anything may happen. So on that time some of the unwanted characters may be get introduced. Next it depends on the external agencies for uh, pollination. So it has to depend on uh, other agencies. It has to depend on the wind, it has to depend on the insects, it has to depend on the animals. So an external agent should come and have the pollen grain to trans for the transpiration. So it has to depend on other organisms. So uh, that is also a disadvantage. It has to see uh, the condition has to be very appropriate. When it is not, then pollination will get failed. So these are the points under disadvantage here. You now we saw the importance of pollination, the two types of pollination, the self-pollination and the cross-pollination, they are advantages and disadvantages. Now I will give you a short recap from the first. First we saw the importance of pollination. Uh, after fertilization what happens? Fruits and seeds are produced and new varieties of plants will be produced from cross pollination. Then we saw the types of pollination. First is the self pollination and next is the cross pollination. So self pollination means autogamy is called as autogamy because it does not need any help. It can independently pollinate. When pollen grains transfer uh, from the anther to the sigma within the same plant, then it is called as self pollination. Then we saw a few advantages. Uh, it will be possible in bisexual class. Uh, it does not have to depend on any agents and no wastage of pollen grains. Disadvantage uh, seeds will be very less in number and the endosperm will be very small, so weak plants are produced and no new varieties of plants are produced. The second uh, type is the cross pollination, the transfer of pollen grains transfer from the anther of one plant to the anther of another plant but we are of same species then it is called as cross pollination. So advantages seeds will develop and they germinate to form new varieties of plants and viable seeds are produced those which have the ability to germinate and disadvantages pollination may fail due to distance barrier when it is at a long distance it may fail and more wastage of pollen grains may happen it may introduce some unwanted characters and it depends on uh, external agencies for pollination it has to depend on other organisms for pollination in the last board we saw the types of pollination so we saw the self pollination and cross pollination so for cross pollination means when the pollen grains are transferred from one plant to another then it is called as cross pollination. So for transferring of uh, pollen grains from one plant to the other we need agencies or agents for the transfer of pollen grains. 
Now here we are going to see those agents for cross pollination. What are the agents? What are the uh, animals or water or whatever it is? All the things that are involved in the transfer of pollen grains from one plant to another. So we are going to see that in detail. So pollen should be taken from one flower to another. So pollination means what pollen grain should be taken from one flower to the other. So for that we need agents like uh, animals, insects, wind and water. So these are some of the agents for cross pollination for the transfer of pollen grains. So first we are going to see the pollination by wind. So this pollination by wind is called as anemophily. Anemophily. So those plants that uh, pollinate through wind are known as anemophilous plants. They produce enormous pollen grains. So what happens? This uh, plants that pollinate through wind have enormous pollen grains. They produce a large amount of Pollen grains. Pollen grains, they will be very small, smooth, dry and light in shape. So, if, the, if these characteristics are present, then only they can fly in the air. It should be very light, then only when the wind blows, it can fly. So, it should be very small, smooth, dry and light in shape. So, these are some of the characteristics of pollen grains. Next, pollen are blown off. At a distance of more than 1000 km, when a uh, heavy uh, wind blows, what happens? It can flow or uh, can float up to 1000 km, more than 1000 km. So, the stigmas are large, protruding, and heavy to trap pollen grains. So, here they are mentioning about the gynesium. So, how the stigma should be? So stigma only should receive the pollen grains. So it should be very large protruding means it should be short, well shown and it should be very hard. It should have small small hairs uh, to trap the pollen grains. So example grass and cacti. Cacti are nothing but cactus. So these are the points under pollination by wind. Next is Pollination by insects. Pollination by insects. So this pollination by insects are called as entomophily. Entomophily. So to attract insect, uh, insects, flowers are large and brightly colored, nectar and smell. So here we saw it should be very large, it should be receiving, it should have small small hairy like structures. Here likewise to attract insects, what, what, how it should be, the flower should be very large, it should be brightly colored for the insects to come and it should have big care and it should have a very good smell. So these are the characteristics to attract the insects so that uh, it will take the pollen grains from one plant and leave it on the other plant. So uh, that is why it should look like this. Pollen grains are larger, excite is pitted, spiny, so they can adhere to the sticky stigma. So here uh, how it should be? The pollen grain should be very large. It should not be very small. It should be very large. The excite, the outer layer should be pitted. So it should be very hollow. Uh, pitted means it should be very hollow. It should be spiny. It should have a spine. So if it is like uh, if it has spines, what happens if, uh, when uh, when the uh, insect goes to the plant to the gynecium, it will get stick. That is why uh, spine should be present so that they can adhere, so that they can stick to the sticky stigma. So uh, for for the convenience of the insect pollination, what are the characteristics should be present? So these are some of the characteristics. 80% of insect pollination is done by honeybees only. So 80% of the pollination is done by honeybees only. In insect pollination, 
uh, honey bees only are responsible for most of it. Then the third is the pollination by water. So this pollination by water is known as hydrophily. Hydrophily. So hydro means water. Hydrophily is the pollination by wind. So water means what happens? Aquatic plants are only involved. Aquatic plants are nothing but those which live in water are known as aquatic plants. So since uh, pollination is through water, those uh, plants which live in water are involved in such pollination. So they are together called as aquatic plants. So next, the pollen grains produced in large number. Here also the pollen grains are produced in very large number. Pollen grains float on water until they land on the stigma of the female flower. So it should have, it should float, uh, uh, it may be uh, at a very long distance or it may be at a very uh, nearby distance, whatever it is, until it reaches the female flower, it has to go on floating on the water. So, uh, like this only pollination happens in water. Example, hydrilla and Galisnavia. So, these are the plants involved in pollination by water. The fourth type is pollination by animals. So, next is pollination by animals. Pollination by animals are called as zoophily. zoophily. Flower attract animals by bright color scent and size. So here also what happens? To attract the animals, it should be very bright in color, it should have a good aroma, it should be in a very large size so that the anima animals get attracted. So example, sun bird pollinates flowers of henna and gladioli. So sun bird will be, will be in blue color. So that bird what happens? It pollinates in henna and Gladioli. So these are the two uh, names of plants, etc. The sunbird only pollinates these two plants. Next is squirrels pollinate plants of silk cotton. So silk cotton we know. So for that squirrels only pollinates. So these are the points under pollination by animals. Now I am going to give you a small recap on it first. First we saw the uh, cross pollination. What is cross pollination? When there is a transfer of pollen grains from one plant to another, then it is known as cross pollination. So for such transfer, we need some of the agents. So now uh, we are going to see all those agents in detail. Pollen should be taken from one plant to another. Agents are Animals, insects, wind and water. First we are going to see the pollination by wind. It is also called as anemophily. Those anemophilous flowers produce a large amount of pollen grains. And pollen grains should be very small, smooth, dry and very light in grain. So when they are, they, these pollen grains are blown off uh, at a distance of more than 1000 km. And this stigma should be very large protruding and hairy to trap the pollen grains. Example, the grass and cacti. Next is pollination by insects. It is also known as entomophily. Uh, to attract the uh, insects for how the flower should be, it should be very large, it should be brightly colored, it should have nectar and it should have a very good smell. The pollen grains, it should be very large. The insect is it should be very hollow, spiny, so they can adhere, so they can stick to the sticky stigma. 80% of the insect pollination is done by honeybees only. The third is pollination by water. It is also known as hydrophily. Aquatic plants are involved in hydrophily. So the pollen grains are produced in very large number. Pollen grains float on water until they land on the stigma of the female flower. So they should float uh, until they reach the female flower. Example, Hydrilla and Galisnavia. Next is the pollination by animals. It is also known as zoophily. Flowers attract animals by bright color. It should have a very large size. 
and it should have a very good aroma. Example, sun bird pollinates flowers of canna and gladiola etc. Then squirrels pollinate flowers of silk cotton tree. Next, we are going to see about the fertilization in plants. So, first we saw the structure of androecium and glycosium. Then we saw the structure of pollen grains. Then we saw the structure of ovules. Then what happens? We saw the parts. Then we saw how, how it pollinates, how the pollen grain from the anther moves to the stigma of the gynecium. So the transfer of pollen grains is called pollination. So we saw that next in the process of uh, reproduction, the second thing was the fertilization. So you have to remember all the parts and all the structures to understand this fertilization. So you should know what uh, androecium is, you should know what gynecium is, how the pollen grain structure is and how the ovules are present, the structure of ovule and what are the parts involved. Then only you can understand the fertilization in plants. So uh, 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 moving on to the structure, here the pollen grains are present and a pollen tube is present. The style is present. Style will be present in the ovary. So it will be present in the gyration style, stigma and ovary. Then here you can find the ovule diagram and it is present, the ingredients are present and male gametes are present. So uh, I am going to tell in detail now. So what happens in pollination? The transfer of pollen grain from anther to stigma has taken place. Next what happens is, the pollen grain after reaching the stigma, the pollen grain reach the right stigma and germinate. So what happens, the uh, pollen grain, uh, it would have been self-pollination or cross-pollination to wind the water or insects, whatever it is, what happens, it reaches the stigma of the gynecia. Then it starts to germinate. Then pollen grains form a tube-like structure called pollen tube. So what happens is pollen grain, it forms a tube-like structure. It forms a tube-like structure uh, called pollen tube. Then what happens? It merges through the germ pore. So germ pore, where you have, you have heard this term germ pore? In the structure of pollen grains, the outer layer extent will have small small pores called germ pore. So in that germ pore it merges. So uh, the outer layer or uh, the pores are present, the germ pore. From there only the tube arises as it merges through the germ pore. And contents of the pollen grain move through the tube. What happens after the tube is being formed? All the contents, so what amount is inside the pollen grains moves through the tube. Then pollen tube grows through the tissues of style and stigma. So what happens? The ovary style stigma is present. Through the style and stigma, this pollen tube will grow and reaches the ovary. So then only they can reach the ovary. If it comes from the stigma, then side then only they can reach the ovary and inside the ovary ovule is present. So what happens? It has to enter through the tissues of side and stigma. So and finally it reaches the ovule through the microphyla. So uh, when you remember uh, the ovule diagram, you know, this ovule diagram is here and this is the chalaza end and here is the microphyla and through this end only what happens? The um, pollen tube is entered. Then vegetative cell degenerates. So we learned in the structure of uh, ovule two types of cells are present: vegetative cell and generative cell. So vegetative cell, what happens? It de degenerates. It just gets destroyed. It just gets uh, disappeared. Then the generative cell it has two main gametes. Uh, in the ambition we have a vegetative cell and a generative cell. So what happens? This vegetative cell degenerates, it disappears and 
regenerative cell what happens it divides to form two stalks so since it is a male granule since it is from the androecium the two uh, sperms what happens two male gametes are formed as two sperms and the tip of the pollen tube bursts so over what happens the tip of the pollen tube uh, from the pollen grain what happens it just bursts out then two sperms enter the embryo sac so what happens two sperms from the uh, enters the uh, two sperms from the pollen grain enters through the mitophyta end and what happens one sperm fuses with the egg so where is the egg in the ovule this one so two antiporal cells are present this a uh, big one the egg apparatus if you want if you don't remember the structure of ovary ovule means turn on to your uh, book and see the structure of ovule so there you will find uh, in the mitophyta and you will find two antipolar cells and above that a big cell will be there so that only is the egg apparatus together it is called as egg apparatus and that is the egg cell so what happens two sperms are present one sperm will fuse with the egg it goes to and fuse with the egg and that is called as syngamy the fusion of one sperm with the egg is called as syngamy and forms a diploid zygote so what happens it uh, fertilizes and forms a diploid two end so two end zygote this form next what happens the other sperm fuses with the secondary nucleus so where is the secondary nucleus this two dots this polar nuclei so this is called as the secondary nucleus what happens the second sperm goes and fuses with the secondary nucleus and they form the primary endosperm primary endosperm so it is known as triple fusion why it means two secondary nucleus are present and two that are sperm is added so it is known as triple fusion triple fusion and it will give a triploid nucleus three and number of nucleus so first uh, first sperm goes and uh, fertilizes with the egg and forms a two-end zygote and the other one goes and fuses with the second nucleus and forms a triploid nucleus then what happens the double fertilization since two fertilization takes place that is two fusion takes place one one is here uh, with the egg and other is with the secondary nucleus since two fertilization two fusion takes place it is known as double fertilization syngamy and triple fusion takes place at a time so it is known as double fertilization after the triple fusion the primary endosperm nucleus develops into the endosperm so what happens after the fusion of the second nucleus it forms a primary endosperm that primary endosperm later on forms as endosperm what is endosperm in the seed the endosperm only gives nutrition to the uh, seed so uh, in all the seeds the endosperm will be present so uh, from a primary endosperm it is being uh, developed as endosperm then endosperm only provides food for developing embryo and synergies and antipodals are degenerated they disappear gradually so where is this synergies this is the synergies synergies and the antipodal cells also disappear so these are the fertilization that takes place in plants now we are going to see about the significance of fertilization that this fertilization only stimulates ovary to fruit so from ovary how a fruit is formed through fertilization only it helps in the development of new characters from new individuals so uh, remember cross pollination what happens the pollen is transferred from one plant to another each plant will have one one character when there is a transfer of pollen grains what happens the characters are getting interchanged so that we can get new varieties new combinations of characters so uh, uh, after reaching uh, the pollen grain reaches what
what happens? It has to fertilize. Then only the new character, new variety will be revealed. So that is what it says here. It helps in development of new characters from new individuals. So these are the two significance of fertilization. Now I am going to give you a small recap from the first. First, uh, we are going to see the fertilization in animals. First, uh, sorry, plants. First, what happens? Pollen grain reaches the stigma and they start to germinate. The pollen grain forms a tube-like structure called pollen tube. It merges to the germ core of the uh, outer layer of the pollen grain and the contents of the pollen grain are moved through the pollen tube. Then pollen tube grows through the tissues of tiny stigma of the vermicium and it reaches the ovule through the micropylar end and vegetative cell regenerates and generated cell is present it divides to form two sperms the tip of the pollen tube is getting bursted and two sperms enter the embryo sac of the gynecium the ovule and one sperm fuses with the egg to form diploid zygote it is called as syngamy and the other sperm fuses with the secondary nucleus to form primary endosperm and forms a triploid nucleus so this is called as triple fusion since both the fusions are taking place at a time it is known as double fertilization after the triple fertilization what happens the primary endosperm is being developed into endosperm endosperm only provides food for the developing embryo and synergies and antipodals are getting re regenerated then next is significance of fertilization uh, fertilization only stimulates ovary to form into a fruit and it helps in the development of new characters from one individual to another to form new characters through pollination till now we saw about the process of fertilization how uh, the fertilization takes place that is after the pollen grain reaches the stigma of the gynecium what are the processes happen how they fertilize so those are the things we saw now we are going to see about the post fertilization changes so after fertilization after the pollen grain has been reached to the stigma of the gynecium what happens uh, after that is being said here so what happens the ovules develop into a seed the ovule diagram do you remember it the structure of ovule what happens that ovule will be converted and developed into a seed and the incubus of the ovule will develop into a seed core so what happens the uh, in the humans have the two layers that cover the embryo sac if you don't catch the diagram take your book and see the structure of ovule there you will find two layers of integuments so that will be uh, developed into a seed core and next is ovary enlarges the whole ovary will get enlarged 